Okay, um, I'm now going to move to a selection of questions from uh, institutions based here in Washington uh, who are tied to the new administration. Lynn, the next question comes from uh, a section of the Economic Advisory Group. And they say, um, Mr. LaRouche, we represent a multidisciplinary group centered at Stanford, Berkeley, and Princeton, who since early November have been tasked with working on your triple curve function as a model for economic analysis. Little argument can be made right now as to its accuracy in defining our current predicament. However, it's my understanding that you developed this model long before financial instruments like derivatives ever even existed. This may be too involved a question for you to address in this venue, but if you can, would you please indicate to us how you were able to forecast this dynamic before the instruments which arguably caused this current crisis were even born? <laughs> well, I was a smart kid. <laughs> but essentially, no, I understood economics. That's why my, my discoveries in economics were, well, of course, part of a childhood experience in a sense. My father was a consultant in the, in the footwear industry and a few other things, and I was never dumb. Uh, I got into a lot of trouble for that reason. But... Uh, he said, no, but in 1953, I, I, in a sense, completed a, a phase of, shall we call it, my education. Uh, and by that time, I had adopted the, uh, I had understood that we cannot possibly deal with or understand economic processes except as looking at them, first of all, as physical economic processes rather than monetary or financial processes. And secondly, that we, had, we could not do this unless we abandoned the usual Cartesian-type methods of thinking about economy, even physical economy, which are prevalent in most universities today. Uh, that you had to use, uh, you had to apply the concept of dynamics as reintroduced to modern civilization in the 1690s by uh, Gottfried Leibniz, and then the concept advanced competence dynamics by B Bernard Riemann. And Riemann's conception as exemplified by his famous habilitation dissertation of 1854 is the, is the key to understanding all, the competent understanding today of any physical kind of physical process. And economic processes as physical processes can be only understood as Riemannian systems. Now, the fun in Riemannian system, the variable you're looking at, as in dynamics, and you could go back to the uh, 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 dynamicum of, uh, of Leibniz in uh, 95, six, six, uh, 1695, specimen dynamicum, to for the definition of this. The point was is that the reductionists in physical science and so forth, are idiots. And they should not be allowed to, they can repair things, but they should not try to design anything. I mean, it's allowed, but not, not, not designed. Because the, the, see, the difference between man and a beast is that no beast is capable of creating the discovery of a valid universal physical principle. Only an individual human mind can do that. This, of course, is the reason implicitly why academician Vanadsky uh, emphasized the uh, question of the noosphere as distinct from the biosphere. That human beings are not, or human beings are actually essentially set, uh, spiritual, you would call them, because what happens in the human body is a biological entity, apparently. But it has a function it performs intellectually, which is not biological. And this function is called creativity, and it's most easily identified, that is from a scientific experimental standpoint, by the discovery of a universal physical principle. 
It also has a complementary way of being defined in terms of artistic composition. But the most common approach is to physical principles. Now, in physical principle, as in the case of the Leibniz differential, as opposed to all the other versions of things in calculus, is that this, this concept of Leibniz comes essentially from uh, the discovery of gravitation by Johannes Kepler. And what Kepler did was to discover the differential, the infinitesimal, in terms of the characteristic of the planetary, such as the orbit of Earth, that there's no way by quadrature of the ellipse or quadrature of the circle that you can define the meaning of the infinitesimal in the curvature of the planetary orbit. Now, this was then treated again by, by Kepler in what is called the harmonies of, of the world. And in book four of the harmonies of the world, he takes the thing up in a very specific way, which was later addressed by, by Alfred Einstein, Albert Einstein. And that is that the harmonics of the organization of the solar system hmm, are such that the, you cannot explain this from a visual standpoint or from a simple oral system. That is not from the sense of sight, the use of the function of the concept of the section of sight to portray the orbital pathway, or from the function of sound, simple sound, to define the orbital pathway. But rather, you have to rely upon something from music called harmonics. And you realize then, when you do, do this, as that you are dealing with something, a phenomenon, in which neither the sense of sight nor hearing defines the phenomenon you're looking at, the phenomenon of change, which you're looking at, which defines the orbital system of the planetary system. So Leibniz, in this sense, in the 1690s, returned to this conception, because he was a student of the work of Kepler. All modern science, all competent modern science, comes from the work of Johannes Kepler, of physical science. Anything else is, forget it. So he recognized that the infinitesimal of the calculus, which he had been originally discovered, based on this appreciation of this work of Kepler, involved an ancient conception from, uh, which is called the, uh, the infinitesimal, was called and the, uh, no, with this, with, with the, what he called the infinitesimal, that this uh, of, hum, of dynamics. Hmm? And therefore, we, have, we understand that the creativity is always expressed, a creative in terms of physical principle, is always expressed in terms of this kind of dynamics of the infinitesimal, which, is, uh, which has no, no finite quality, but is simply the appearance of a principle as a discontinuity in a system of action. Right. So therefore, the, what the difference between man and the animal is, is that mankind, by discovery of new physical principles and applying these to production, is able to transform man's power to generate physical values, to increase man's power to produce something, that sort of thing. And so therefore, this, this kind of concept is the basis for all competent science, all competent economy. All present economists, as taught in universities, do not know this. And therefore, they try to figure out from a financial system the idea of profit in terms of a financial system, or marginal income, in terms of a financial system, not in terms of a physical system. And what in all, all progress of science is based on that. For example, let's take the case of simple case of, of simple stupidity among today's typical environmentalist. If you measure power in, cal in calories, you're an idiot. If you think that a calorie of sunlight is equivalent to a calorie of, of, of nuclear power, you're an idiot. 
because a calorie of nuclear power is thousands of times more powerful than a calorie of sunlight. Sunlight is very useful when it comes in the form of solar radiation in terms of chlorophyll, extremely useful. Then the sunlight increases its, its work, the power increases its work on behalf of man or on behalf of nature in many ways. Whereas if you simply use it as power, what do you do? If you use up all the sunlight, you make a desert. If you take the sunlight and apply it to plant life, you make prosperity. So sunlight, in a sense, as a living principle, of solar, the chlorophyll is a living principle, actually increases man's power in and over the universe. Whereas the same number of calories consumed as solar power for a solar reactor is a waste of time. What is it? If you not, have enough solar pl pl plectors, what do you get? You got a desert. You have enough calories, you get enough chlorophyll, you get a forest. That's the difference. And you get human life and that and all kinds of things. All right. So therefore, it is human creativity, individual creativity of the individual human mind, such as physical discoveries, universal physical discoveries. The application of these to the productive process in particular is the means by which man is able to increase his power to exist on this planet. So what you have is then you have, in, you have financial systems. All these financial systems of economy, they're not worth anything because they don't take into account the most important thing. How you increase the productive power of labor per square kilometer and per capita in a world in which the key opposing factor is depletion. If you simply try to do the same thing over and over again you're going, and expand the population on that basis, you're going to run down the planet. If, on the other hand, you take and use creative methods, which involve this concept, which Leibniz defined as the differential, the, the infinitesimal, and you apply this as in the case of chlorophyll or in the case of nuclear power, which is thousands of times more efficient than the same amount of calories expressed in the form of sunlight on, the, on binging on the earth. So it's this characteristic. So it, what happens is you find in the history of mankind that all backward societies, including especially societies of slavery, prohibit the slave from developing discoveries of principle. The slave is told to follow in the footsteps of his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather and not to try to change the way in which he produces. Now, the effect of this is in all societies which are fixed-mode societies lead to the destruction of the society by itself simply by continuing to exist. All societies which are successful take, take natural resources and increase the power of natural resources by these kinds of methods called discoveries, which is, reflects the same kind of principle that Kepler recognized in the organization of the solar system or that uh, Einstein and others recognized uh, in, in terms of the way the world is organized. So the problem with, with economists generally is they don't look at this factor of creativity. They call all kinds of creativity, including the ability to masturbate in new ways. But that's not creativity. <clears throat> it's the discovery and use of newly discovered principles which increase man's power in and over the universe. And the organization of these discoveries in the form of production or other relevant ways to increase the power of man to exist and to exist in a better way. So therefore, economy is not to be studied, first of all, as financial economy or monetary economy, but to be examined as a physical process, a physical scientific process with attention to things like life, as in the case of Vernadsky's work on life and on the idea of the noosphere. So you're looking for the principle of change, which distinguishes on the one hand living processes from non-living ones and, and human processes which are distinguished advantageously from non-human uh, pro living processes. And this is expressed by invention, by production, and also by the development of an appropriately improved infrastructure such as an increase of nuclear power, and the greater the nuclear power, 
in terms of uh, square centimeter power, the greater, the greater your productivity. So therefore, if I go into in India and I find an Indian farmer who is what he is in his skill, and I bring in the factor of nuclear power in the form of in enhanced water resources, freshwater resources, which you can only make efficiently from nuclear reactors, as with, say, the thorium cycle reactor, which is uh, appropriate for the coast of India, then you have increased the productive power of labor of that farmer without changing the way he produces, because you have changed the conditions under which he produces and therefore increased his productivity. So all economy is based on that. The problem we have, for example, is, is under uh, the former uh, secretary, uh, director of, of the, uh, our monetary system, our Federal Reserve system, who was an idiot. And his idiocy has dominated the interpretation of what productivity is in the United States today. Forget Greenspan. Get rid of him. He's gone. Get rid of what he did. Therefore, we have to have a, mon a system which, is a, which functions not on the basis of counting dollars or counting marbles, by, in, by counting the increase of the level of productivity per capita and per square kilometer of the, the United States and of other countries. This means investment, capital intensive investment in technologies and in modes of production which multiply the effective productivity of the working individual, or the producing individual. And therefore, if you want an economy which is going to grow, you have to have a capital-intensive investment. Because to build a nuclear power that plant, that costs a bit of money. It wears out over, say, 40 or 50 years, if you maintain it properly. So you have a 40-year investment. It's a capital investment. And the parts of the capital investment is not the size of the investment in money. The importance of the capital investment is the amount of the increased yield per moment of action that you get as a result of that power at that intensity. It's, it's just simply a matter of physical science. You raise, from, you raise the level of energy flux density of any process, you raise, increase the potential productivity of that process. And you just simply have to know enough science, enough physical science and other things to know how to make that work. Hmm. That's simple. So therefore, what we need is capital-intensive, long-term investments, concentrating, first of all, on the basic economic infrastructure. First of all, water, power, mass transportation, and so forth. Make these more efficient. Therefore, even simple labor will be increased in its productivity because you have created the environmental preconditions for enhancing the productive, effective productive power of that act of production. And that's the point. The problem is, is that this has left. So it was, for me, it was simple to forecast. My forecast cycles always worked on this way. The, the condition I was forecasting about was different. You know, the auto industry it, forecasts I did back in the 1950s, which was unique, but it was very simple for me. I was simply doing consulting in this area. I knew a number of these whole auto industries, knew how the thing was rigged. And I said, along with other industries which are doing something similar, I said, this is, this is finished. It's gone. When I find that somebody has a vehicle which has a 24-month life, useful life, and it's being, is, bought, is sold on the basis of 36 months with a giant balloon note in the 36th month, and I find that not only the auto industry is being run that way, but many other industries are run that way, I can look at the capital factors and tell you at the point this is going to blow out. It's that simple. And that's what, that, it's that kind of consideration to give a simple illustration, which I used. It's always the same. We kept coming back to one condition under Truman. We got to another condition, which is the Vietnam War condition, under, which the, under the Vietnam War conditions that we, we were destroying the economy. And we were going to destroy the economy once the policy of Wall Street and London was introduced. The policy against which Kennedy fought in the steel issue, steel negotiation issue, once Kennedy's policy was eliminated, the United States was going to go the way these guys were going to send him. 
And it went that way. By 1968, it was going that way. In 1961, they blew it. And the same thing happened in, in, 19, in 1970s. They blew it again. The Trilateral Commission. The Trilateral Commission did the greatest amount of destruction to the United States economy in terms of rate of any time in its modern history. Until we got to, the, until we got to George Bush, George Bush I, the Emperor George I. And he did a good job. And then you had the effect of the Green Revolution in effect, the anti-industrial, the anti-nuclear, all this kind of thing. And again, what we were counting upon as production was fake. The ratio between the cost of production to the U.S. population as a whole and the benefits of production was such we were losing. And what happened then is Greenspan came in and Greenspan said this doesn't work. This is after the, the crash, the October 1987 crash. It didn't work. We I forecast that one. And what he did is he went to financial derivatives of self-inflating fake money. And the world economy now is sitting under the weight of four, a 1.4 quadrillion dollars of absolutely fake money, and under the present conditions, that fake money is growing like a cancer, while the world economy in terms of employment and production and goods produced is shrinking. So therefore, what you have to do is you have to take the cancer and excise it. The entire financial derivatives bubble created by Alan Greenspan has to be taken out in the backyard and shot. And then buried. <laughs> That's the solution. So there was nothing mysterious about this because when you think about how these curves function, it's, it simply was to me. I, I, I had a Vatican conference I attended where it happened, the curve itself, and it was on health care. So I submitted a report to the Vatican on my participation in that conference. And then later, the, in the following months, I was running for president, so I just published this triple curve on that basis. All that was was the description of what I know, the way the system is working, and the way the system has worked ever since I first got into the business back in 1953 as a successful student of the work of Bernard Riemann on the principle of creativity. <laughs>